1620. Japan decides that it's really tired of all these Westerners. You see, they arrive in their boats and they got all these fandangled contraptions and the inventions. And the Japanese at the time, they, they're not all that happy with us Westerners. This is an example of a society that said no to growth. So I'm telling you the story of a society that said no to growth. It was like the Japanese version of Luddites. Except more successful. The Luddites didn't. Once they had their underwear, they were so happy. It wasn't just growth, it was any kind of cultural uh, change at all. Yeah. You see, they wanted things to stay the same. That um, if you wanted to kill somebody, you couldn't use a gun, you had to chase them with a sword. Guns were outlawed. Pretty much any technology which changed things, ah, damn, make it illegal. You see, and, and they also banned all Westerners, except for one tiny little island where they set up a university. And the job of this university, you see, was they invited Westerners over, particularly from Holland, where they would learn more about Western cult culture for the purpose of being able to learn how to keep them out. <laughs> they didn't want any of this new technology fandangle changes. So the world, it, at about that time, there was nothing really the West could do. Japan was pretty much on an equal military footing, so they went their separate ways. Now, Japan stayed the same, kept the same rules. You want to kill somebody, take a sword, guns illegal, etc., etc. But the West, they invented more things. The technology, the efficiencies just spiraled into increasing growth. You see, efficiency does give one a competitive advantage. The ones that use their resources the most, that are more efficient, have a military advantage over those that want, didn't. Now, in America, they, they started to, um, well, I should remember. Anyway, in, in the United States, what was the admiral, admiral, uh, admiral, the one of the black ships, the four black ships, admiral, Da, 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 da. Where's that guy with the four black ships? The bad guy with the four black the ships. That guy, I said. So, <laughs> when he forced the treaties to Japan? Yes. Admiral, 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 Admiral. Oh, yeah. So what's his name? 1840. Yeah, what was his name? Okay, that's it. You're. <laughs> I don't know. So, anyway, United States. Uh, they now said. Um, Commodore Matthew Perry, ha, ah, took it a while. So he arrives in Japan and he has the black ships. The reason why they were called had two purposes. One was because they were both coal and, uh, and, and wind powered and they had this big plume of smoke and they had these cannons. And the other one was that it represented technology to the Japanese. The black ships arrived. Matthew Perry says, I'm here. And unless you sign these treaties and these agreements and blah, 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 we're going to bl blow you to smithereens, which they did occasionally to prove the might of their technology. And Japan realized that it could not compete. Bow and arrows were no match for cannons, and their little sail junks weren't able to really do much damage either. You see, technology gave them a military advantage. Japan then says, well, we've got a few things to learn. So now they send all their students off to, off to Europe to learn about all these new technologies. They come back and they change everything about Japan. Previously, if you wanted to do so much as chop down a tree, you had to get a permit in triplicate. They had 250 years of some of the most peaceful times that they had, uh, 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 the peaceful period. But now things had changed. You see, they were now more resource dependent. They needed resources. And the first country they invade was, uh, they did exactly what the Americans did to them. They did to the Koreans. Same treaty, hey, we've got, uh, we've got a navy here. What have you got? Ooh, swords, oh, well, just sign over here, thank you. <laughs> and that pretty much carries on, and they start invading China as well, which eventually turns into the First World War and the Second World War. And well, anyway, so anyway, what the point that I'm getting at is that in a competitive scenario of free trade, countries that do not have any type of protection on worker standards or resource extractions 
have a competitive advantage. They can produce more at a competitive price. And countries that decide to make things more inefficient, countries that want to put value on quality of life, have less of a competitive advantage. In a free trade scenario, adding inefficiencies into your, your production and society is dangerous. It can't really be done in a free trade scenario. I don't know all the answers, I just wanted to tell a story. And add a problem to the equation. Yeah,